we're in the middle of a transformational moment in this industry. You have to be loud. You have to be different. The audiences are demanding it. When you can let other perspectives come in, it only helps to bolster the project. We have to be the storytellers of our own stories. Be confident and embrace your vision. All right. Hello, hello, and good afternoon. I'm Ruben Garcia, co-head of Cultural Business Strategy at Creative Artist Agency, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Transparency Talk, which is ongoing, an ongoing series of conversation from Stars' Take the Lead campaign. Today's panel topic, super important, we're going to be discussing the impact of education on increasing opportunities for underrepresented students. I'm so thrilled to be moderating this conversation with a group of really incredible panelists. Let's get to know them quickly. We'll start with Carl Gist. He is the founder of NOCA Global, a DEIA consulting firm that provides career pathways into jobs in creative industries. His background in public policy, project management, business, and program development provide clients with transformative solutions to issues caused by government policy, lack of employee diversity, and insufficient access to industry game changers and influencers. Welcome, Carl. So glad that you're here. Next up, Thank you. It's a pleasure. we have Eli Reed. He is a magnum photographer, photojournalist, Sony artisan, filmmaker, and retired professor from the University of Texas at Austin. He's, al he's also authored several books and received numerous awards, including a Pulitzer Prize nomination, Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University, Global Fund Excellence in Media Award, and the Harvard IF Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence. Eli, I don't know what to do with all of that, but so glad that you are here. Next, we have Susan Cartsonis. Uh, she was named by The Hollywood Reporter as one of the top five grossing producers of the year for the films What Women Want and Where the Heart Is. Most recently, she produced the Netflix summer 2020 hit, Feel the Beat, but also Freaky Friday, the musical, The Duff, I'm a personal fan of that film, No Reservations, and Aqua Marine. Cartsonis is also currently completing the feature action adventure film, True Spirit for Netflix. And on top of all of that, she is teaching at USC. Welcome, Susan. And next up, we have my friend Sumi Parekh. She's the executive director for the Group Effort Initiative, uh, which is an organization that was launched and is financed by Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively in August of 2020. GEI strives to create a pipeline for members of underrepresented communities to get real experience towards lasting careers within the entertainment industry. And prior to joining GEI, Sumi worked for the Los Angeles or for Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, holding a number of positions. Always lovely to see you, my friend. Um, and finally, here we have Doug Blush. He's an award-winning director, producer, editor, writer, and cinematographer whose work includes over 140 feature and television projects. He's also a longtime film educator with classes and seminars at USC, Syracuse University, Northwestern University, and the Young Arts Foundation in Miami, as well as exchanges and panels in more than eight countries. Now, I know you also teach at, U at US UCLA. I'm a Bruin, but we're all going to get along just fine today. Um, <laughs> welcome, everyone. So glad that you're here. Look, we've got a ton to dive into. Carl, I was hoping that we could start with you. You have over 15 years working in the space, trying to connect the dots to create more opportunities for underrepresented and historically marginalized or excluded communities across our business. Can you give us a brief overview of some of the more pressing challenges, a, a little bit of a lay of the land that you think that we are facing um, across media and entertainment? And more specifically, would love to know what progress you have seen that is encouraging to the work. Yeah, sure. Um, so during my time sort of doing a survey and, and unpacking things, and I'm, I'm a, I have an engineering background, so by nature, I like to deconstruct things and figure out how they, how they work. And uh, this in industry was a bit of an anomaly, especially coming from uh, politics. And so what I did was I just started to make my rounds to really understand the various pain points and gaps that uh, companies were facing when it came to diversifying their employee population. Really what I found was there was an issue with uh, talent pool sourcing, uh, workplace culture, socialization, uh, coaching, uh, 
working within the framework of a CBA that they may need to comply with, and then understanding the importance of community partnerships. Um, in terms of you know, the progress that I've seen, especially over the last 10 years, I would say there's definitely been an acute interest in working with community partners. Uh, for example, one of my clients is the LA Urban League. Um, they're, they're, they are 100 years old. And so um, there's just no substitute for an organization that has 100 years of experience engaging and understanding the needs of their constituents. And so when you're talking about um, accessing that talent pool that resides in those underrepresented communities to be able to place them in jobs, you really need to understand what needs they will have coming into that opportunity and how they need to be supported before and after they've been pl placed in that job. That's a great point. I think you're a wealth of knowledge and we're gonna have a lot to unpack with what you just um, shared with us. I, I would actually love that it brings up a great point for Susan and Eli. You both have had very successful careers in arts and entertainment industries, which I think maybe gives you a little bit of an edge in the classroom. Can you talk a bit about your journeys and what inspired you to start teaching? Well, Susan, let's start with okay. you. Um, I was inspired by teachers from the time I was a young kid. And I always wanted to teach, but I wanted to be one of those teachers who had stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And maybe I have a few more stories than I'd like to have to tell. <laughs> but um, I, at, at a certain point, I realized that um, some of what I went through trying to tell stories from the female perspective was probably instructive to the students who were going forward, whether they were women who wanted to tell female-centric stories or whether they were people who had unique experiences, were people of color who wanted to tell their stories and wanted them heard. And I decided that it was time to plunge in and mm. sort of help the next generation, even as I'm still making movies. I'm yeah. prepping a movie right now. I love And that. just ran over from our downtown office to do this panel. I love that. Well, so. thanks for coming. I mean, I think part of that too, I, I think, for you as an educator, would love to, you, you talk about very kind of focused storytelling, right? Women-centric films. Are your students receptive to that as part of the classroom? Is that in, like, is part of your curriculum? Well, this semester they're really receptive because at USC I'm teaching a class about women in the entertainment business. And I have about 26 students, 25 of them are female. Wow. One is a man. Um, I haven't met them yet. I meet them next Tuesday, but right. the entire class is focused on navigating the industry as a woman. And what I find, I, I've taught this class once before, is that sometimes we have people who join the class who are male, who are in um, a situation uh, that, I had a, a gay male student who was in the gaming department of the school and felt like he was marginalized and felt like by taking the class he would find wow. strategies to to deal with his situation. So I think that, you know, gender orientation, all of the DEI issues, they they all kind of dovetail together and when when you talk about them, one helps the other. You yeah. know, there there are strategies that reach across um, culture, across race, across gender, across orientation and that they're all intertwined inextricably yeah. and importantly. Well, I think that's important, I think, when we think about having it included, right, as part of the, the curriculum and the education. Um, Doug, you two have had quite the career in the business. Would love to hear from you. What role did formal education or mentoring play in the evolution of your career? Like, what really worked for you? What, what didn't? Well, I, I love what Susan said about teachers. Teachers, uh, you know, I, I've always considered, you know, teaching really critical to, to any creative career. But I had a teacher in high school who basically rescued me from the track that most people in my high school were on, which is get that that middle management job in the auto industry. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. And she she sort of protected me as an artist and said, you can come here and you can you can be safe to create. You can make things. And we we can honor your vision and do things. And we have been friends ever since. We've never stopped communicating and and like cheering each other on. 
Uh, so she really is a huge part of the reason that I'm able to do what I do now is, uh, you know, and I, that's why I'm such a fan of great public education teachers who take the time to really find the students who need them and, and give them a space. Uh, so Seal Jensen, thank you always. Oh, I love that. A shout out to Mrs. Jensen. Thank you so much. Eli, um, I, I, back to you, you know, would love to hear a little bit about what inspired you to get into teaching. What part of your professional experience led you to the classroom? Well, I was I was doing a, a, a sort of step ins for uh, various universities to go and talk with the students to do a, a, a talk and then walk around with them, basically mm -hmm. uh, get to know them and uh, sort of encourage them on things that they were interested in. And it wasn't always the same thing you might expect, but it was interesting enough that somebody would believe in them. Mm -hmm. that, that was uh, my experience, actually, you know, going to school. And uh, it started from high school, actually. And even when I was in, I think, third grade, some teacher liked this painting I did. And, uh, and that, was a, that was memorable. But it, it just, it's funny how things click on, click on and you just, you keep on going, you keep on going. And, and uh, I, when I was teaching there, I, was, I, I take students, uh, some students that have cars and things like that. So I take them to where they had to do an assignment and I just, I just walk off and let them do the assignment and then I talk with them afterwards. Uh, but uh, and I, I sort of volunteered to work with a, as a volunteer at the Daily Texan. Uh, uh, and uh, it wasn't official or anything like that. But Thursday night, we all get together and start looking at the work that was done during the, uh, during the past week, things like that. But they, they did learn a lot. And I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, good feeling about watching them develop themselves. And, and the number of them have done it very well, and they're still working, still working on things. Amazing. So that's basically just go with your yeah. flow. Go with the flow, and the I flow love finds that. you. Well, let's, the teaching, teaching I, I imagine, is not easy. Um, there's, there's a lot that goes into it, on top of the fact that you guys are working and have your own careers to, to take care of. Um, Sumi, I wanted to turn it over to you, because before GEI, you served as the executive officer to the deputy mayor of economics and the program manager at the Mayor's Fund. Um, what can you tell us about some of the challenges or what you learned about some of the challenges that we we're facing in the, in the industry and what efforts did you put in place to address them? Yeah, so uh, during my time um, at Mayor Garcetti's office, I served, you know, one of the most consistent roles I had was serving as the mayor's entertainment liaison. So I really got the chance to learn about and participate in opportunities um, around impact, um, impacting rep representation within the city of L.A. Um, and this was during the time of, you know, hashtag Oscar so white, the beginning of the Time's Up movement, when lack of diversity, equity and inclusion was kind of at the forefront of the industry. And companies really wanted to engage not just internally, you know, and kind of see how can we improve DEI within our companies, but they also wanted to collaborate and not just collaborate, you know, amongst themselves, but with the public sector. So with people like Mayor Garcetti um, and folks within Los Angeles City Hall, and then with the nonprofit sector who was trying really hard to develop pathways for underrepresented communities within the industry. Um, and so while having these conversations, um, and honestly taking advantage of the fact that, you know, the private sector was very open to talking to us, some of the biggest challenges during that time was there was a lack of awareness. So there was this, you know, nonprofit organization side, local colleges, mainly community colleges and universities across LA, they, they thought they had the training, they thought they were getting their participants ready to go into the entertainment industry, but they didn't really know and didn't have access to those companies to actually give them the jobs that they wanted. Um, and then on the other side, the companies were saying, well, where do we get these diverse candidates? Um, where can I find them? I really wanna hire them, but I don't know where to go. So I think what we found is there was this gap in awareness. Um, and then the second big, big challenge, with, which Carl kind of hinted to during his question, was um, kind of social training and adjustment, making sure these people, not just that they had that professional development training, that they could clean their resume or answer a phone or network, but more about getting them socially adjusted to the entertainment industry. It's a fast paced environment. They've never really worked that type of job. A lot of them are low income, you know, working retail jobs. So how do we better train them? How do we work and partner with these nonprofit organizations to make sure that they're better trained um, and that they're actually job ready for the entertainment industry. And I would say, you know, that was back then, kind of at the beginning of the DEI movement. I would say today, um, one of the biggest challenges I've seen while working at um, GEI 
is, you know, I think we've done, we've all done a good job, the public, the private, the nonprofit sector has done a great job getting these folks prepared, giving them access to entry level jobs. But I think now the next step is how do we make sure they have sustainable, long lasting careers? You know, how do they get from that entry level position to mid level to executive so that the folks at the top can really help um, the communities that they come from at the bottom? I love that. I mean, you guys did such great work in, in the early days. That's where we first met. Yes. Um, and, and the very first meeting, I think, for the Mayor's Fund uh, years and years ago. Um, Doug, I want to turn over to you. I'm, I'm curious to hear from your point of view, how is the state of the industry and your personal work experience impacted what you are currently teaching in the classroom? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been really fortunate in my career, uh, mainly in documentary, in, in really having a diverse slate of projects that I've worked on globally. I've, I've worked basically in every continent that is not snowy all the time. Uh, and it's it really opened up a world of understanding of other cultures and really wanted to bring that back and encourage that in, uh, in my own teaching and uh, in my future work. Um, with my students, what I always try to do is show not just the the canon of what used to be what film school would show, but really, really diversify, go around the world, find find uh, viewpoints and ideas that are maybe new to a lot of our students or that mix up the conversation because we we have a fabulously more diverse uh, student body than when I was a film student. Uh, it's It's just so much better now. and I get so much out of teaching this really diverse group. So I'm learning as much as as my students are as we go. And they want that. They want to see new things. They want to see uh, uh, viewpoints from other cultures and other walks of life. And I'm, I'm super proud that we're going that direction. I love that. Um, you know, Susan, you mentioned a little bit about the class that you're teaching. It's, you know, certainly focused on inclusion and diversity built into the curriculum. Um, what kind of feedback are you getting from the students who are in your classroom? What are they telling you about the experience and how it's impacting their time in the industry? Uh, well, you know, the the real reward is seeing the success of the students who I taught eight and nine years ago and even more recently and seeing them thrive and seeing them find their place, find their voices and start to tell their stories. And often those stories are reflective of multicultural backgrounds. I have one student who is so talented, was um, is Korean, but born in Bolivia. Um, and migrated to the United States to live with her grandparents in Koreatown and attended Beverly Hills High School, but was just, is a jumble of cultures in the richest, most amazing way. And she's making documentary film right now and television that's exceptional. Um, and you just see the excellence of what they're doing and the diversity and excitement and variety that they're bringing to our industry. And they're, they're enriching storytelling in every way. Um, I do focus on sort of practical things like reading the room, literally the room that you're in and the room that is our world and the political climate and taking advantage of that. If you're a woman right now, there are a lot more doors open to you in directing and in telling female-centric stories. And you need to know how to present your stories and, and go for it because there's an opportunity. And um, for my students of color, there are doors that open that are specifically for them and rightfully so. And I try to guide those students about how to, how to take advantage of those. I, I try to make sure that I present them as I know about them and, um, and so on and so forth. But I do see the um, I do see these students who are, not every single student because it's a super competitive industry and not everybody makes it in the area that, that they that they thought they were going to make it into. But it's been very rewarding the proportion of students who are thriving and who have found a place to tell their stories is incredibly gratifying. I love that. Um, Eli, I'd like to talk to you a little bit as well, just about your experience in the classroom. We were chatting just briefly before this, and you mentioned that you're not teaching like classes consistently anymore, but you do some things here and there. I'd love to hear about what, you know, a little bit of feedback that the students are sharing you um, from their time in your classroom about their experience trying to navigate this industry. Well, uh, a lot of it is, is to do with um, ideas, like working on things that are important to them. 
um, and to uh, not to get disappointed if things go slowly. Uh, I'll do things like I'll take them on a, a this Zen walk, and uh, there's, a, there's a, a view outside this uh, one of the buildings. I ask them, what do they say? So in the first seven years there, only one got it. And uh, she was uh, actually <laughs> more sort of uh, into cooking kind of thing, but she all of a sudden changed and got into uh, photography, you know, doing documentary things. And it's it's always uh, so interesting to watch uh, what are what are the real realities? What do they really want to do? What do they think? Of? Because I think sometimes they're afraid to, to make the try. They're yeah. afraid to make that movement uh, into a, a space that they're not really sure of themselves. And I tell them that the best thing you can do is fail a lot because you're going to learn from the mistakes you make and mm. uh, you have to keep going. You don't, you don't stop. And so I, I think um, because I took a real personal interest in that, uh, that way. And I told them my own experiences, you know, uh, getting into uh, photography and photojournalism and a lot of things were inspired by watching TV or watching movies mm. uh, and, and imagining what would you do in this situation? Or how would you, how would you operate on that? And, uh, and then there's some projects I did where uh, some of the students heard I was working on something and, and they just volunteered and it got really interesting. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it gets interesting for me because I'm seeing these different things about like what I used to do and what I would, what I'd hoped to do. And if they can get that excited themselves, magic happens. Yeah. I love that. There's so much about kind of, supporting and appreciating curiosity and exploration, particularly in this industry, because there's so many, this industry is changing every day. There's new opportunities every moment. Um, Sumi, I did want to kind of come over to you because you also work with students. You've been working for students through the Mayor's Fund, but also now at GEI. What are the students telling you about the things that they need to excel in the industry? Are there still places where we're falling short in preparing young people to succeed across uh, the industry? Yeah, I think... Um, there, there's a lot of things that we can improve upon, um, but I think what I'm seeing, particularly working, you know, at the Mayor's Fund and Evolve Entertainment Fund, um, and then now GEI, is I think the biggest challenge is kind of what I mentioned before, how do they sustain a long-lasting career? A lot of them come into our program, they're like, I want to be a writer, I want to be a director, and that's great, and that's, it's great to have that passion and that drive, but we also kind of encourage them to kind of step back, and let's look at how do you approach this career behind the camera? How does the corporate aspect of the entertainment industry work? Kind of how do you become more well-rounded? Because, you know, acting and writing and directing, it's great. It's a wonderful passion to have. I mean, I think that's kind of what we all strive to be if you want to go into the entertainment industry. But I think one thing we're trying to get our folks to understand is there are a lot of other wonderful careers within the industry. Um, you know, and it's great to have a well-rounded career. Maybe one day you'll become a director, writer, or actor, but maybe for now you should learn how to work behind the camera. What are all the different, you know, positions you can get in below the line jobs, you know, as a produ producer, you know, as a production assistant and so on and so forth. So I think that's the biggest concern they have is they come to us. They're always like, okay, I want to be a writer. I want to be a director. You need to help me do that. But I'm like, yes, we will try. We will connect you. We'll make sure you get those networking opportunities, but there's all these other opportunities that you should learn about too, because maybe, and most of the time, this is the case, which is one of our goals, our secret goals, I should say, is that a lot of them are like, wow, there is another really great world out there in the entertainment industry. I didn't know that exists. And a lot of them were like, I think I'm going to do full-time camera. I'm going to go work in wardrobe. Um, I'm actually going to go work in production finance or work in a corporate office and do HR. And so we try to expose them. Uh, because that's always something they come to us first and ask is those writing and directing jobs. So we try to respond by exposing them, giving them training in other aspects of the industry, and just making sure that they have a well-rounded career before they actually are able to tackle their passion long-term. I think that's so important. I mean, we, we talk about, I've heard talking about soft skills. I've talked about the Zen walks. We're talking about well-rounded careers. I think the kind of the through line here that's really critical is making sure that we are attacking this issue from all different angles. I think that's the most important thing, building cultural competency through this incredible class that you have um, that has really important, relevant knowledge and skills to share with people regardless of, of how they identify. Um, Carl, we're gonna come over to you because you have, again, as we, we talked about earlier, you've got a ton of clients in this industry. Um, would love to hear your point of view as someone who's actually been consulting different media and entertainment companies. What are you hearing from your clients? What are some of the consistent challenges that you think can be addressed through education programs and through incredible teachers like those that we have here today? 
Well, I think Sumi actually touched on one of the, the, the big ones, and that's awareness. Um, a lot of folks don't know, and especially if they're coming from an underrepresented community, that there are other jobs that they can take and go after. Um, if I'm a hairstylist or a barber, I don't know if I'm just working in my local barbershop that I can actually work on a production set. Now, there are some hoops that you need to jump through that involve the local union, but there's an opportunity there. If I just want to cook, I, you know, there's craft services. There are a number of jobs that, you know, one can take it that doesn't require them to be a writer, director, or producer. And um, it's just being aware that those jobs are available. And in fact, the state of California has started a registered apprenticeship program through their arts and media and entertainment department. And that's out of the California Department of Education. Uh, they're looking to tackle that awareness piece by making a curriculum available that really allows for students to become aware of the different career paths that lead into jobs in into entertainment. Uh, some of the other things really are so go, really revolve around the socialization aspect. But I, I'd like to touch on something that Mr. Reed uh, spoke about with the Zen walks. A lot of people focus on inclusion. They talk about training, they talk about placement, but what they don't talk about is the baggage one brings when they get placed in that job. There's a mental health component that really needs to be addressed in any project that I'm involved in. I always highlight that there needs to be some sort of access to someone who knows and understands the resources available so that when you hit that wall invariably during training or during your stint in your first job, you need to know where to go. And, and I mentioned before the corporate coach, the corporate coaching, uh, that's where that becomes important because they need to understand that they have someone that has all the hard skills in the world. They have the desire to really understand the work culture, but they may bring a different set of issues to the table and that company needs to be simple. They need to sympathize with that and really work with community organizations to make sure that they have those wraparound services available because that's not in the company's business model to be able to provide those kinds of resources. And so if you're really looking to tap into a new talent pool, um, you wanna make sure that you create an ecosystem that fosters success. Um, and then the, 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 the last thing is really um, going back to the wraparound services. It, it can go beyond mental health access. Uh, one of the things that, for example, the LA Urban League Spec Stage Careers Program does is they provide everything. If you need transportation, they help you get transportation. If you need the technology to make sure that you can complete training, they look to try to do that. Um, they even go so far as if you become an, a, a member of a local union because you satisfy the requirements to join that union, to pay the initial fees to join that union. So. It really is uh, a, a situation where it, there's no silver bullet that can actually solve all of these problems, but it just takes the will of all of the participants involved in a coalition that you would need to really drive what we all want to be as a, a solution that you know results in more inclusion. That, that's a super important point, I, I think, Carl. There's so much to unpack. This industry is is very taxing, right? We it's it's a lot of hard kind of physical work, but it's also a lot of emotional work, a lot of mental work. And so I think addressing this holistically and creating those wraparound solutions is really important. Um, Doug, you know, quickly over to you kind of on the same and similar topic. Carl, we're gonna come back to so much of what you said because there's again a lot to unpack that you've just put in my brain. But Doug, I, I'd like to know what the students are telling you. You you've been teaching for years and years and years. You're still, again, like like Susan and others, working in this business. What are they telling you? What are they saying? You know, Doug, we need more of this. This isn't working. We're challenge. You know, this is our challenge. Yeah. I, first of all, I just want to I want to thank Carl for bringing up the mental health aspect of it because if there's one consistent thing across the entire spectrum of all of my students, it's more attention to the stresses and and just personal care, personal space, personal you know, a, a, a personal unpacking of things that are tough enough when you have no challenges, when you have no biases or anything in this industry. This work is so hard that, um, you know, oftentimes it's just like, hey, suck it up and you don't have to deal with it. 
And students are, are pushing back against that. They say, no, we really, we want to talk about what this is doing to us. And is this a lifestyle that's sustainable? Is this something that we want to uh, be engaged with? And, and I think for the future of our industry, we really need to tackle that. We need to tackle that on all levels and really pay attention to people who are who are coming in with, with issues they need to deal with and the issues that are created in, a, in an industry that still has a long way to go in terms of being completely fair and open and transparent. Um, so yeah, that's that's something I'm hearing a lot of, uh, along with just that desire to, to meet more professionals, um, really hear, hear real stories, hear stories of the real world and what's it really like, what's going on there, and not just learn what the buttons do, you know? And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to give what I can for that, yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. Um, just a, also a quick reminder for those of you who are tuning in. I know there is a way to submit some questions. We're seeing some come in. Thank you so much uh, for engaging with us in this conversation. We're going to get to a few of those um, questions in a moment. One of the things that I did want to talk about, though, and maybe Eli, we'll start with you and Doug and Susan would be great to get your point of view. Um, I think some people might argue that younger generations, in addition to being aware of you know, the industry and the stresses of the industry, they may have more opportunities at building a career because of access to things like a smartphone, things like YouTube. Do you agree with that? Is that enough to have access to those things? Or, or what more should this industry be open to? Susan, why don't we start with you? Students are much more um, sort of film literate when it comes to making movies because they make movies all the time using the smartphone. So yes, they, they do have access to filmmaking from a very, very young age. I mean, little kids are making movies. So film students are coming to us with a raft of skills that previous generations just didn't have because the smartphone is a pretty sophisticated camera and movie making device and they're editing too. So they come to us much more advanced and even somebody who seemingly has no experience in the film business actually may have a, an ability to demonstrate their talent, yeah. you know, very, very quickly because they've, you know, they're very comfortable with a camera. Yeah. So that's one thing. Eli, what do you think? I think I saw you in there with your big camera <laughs> that you kind of travel around with. What do you think about the, the fact that people have access to this? Is it still, is it actually, are you seeing it create opportunities in the industry? It still starts small. I mean, the one I, um, I wonder what, I can't remember exactly where it was, but there's a, there was a, a this little kid, so my first year out of art school, I was teaching this class in the summer. And this little kid uh, was, uh, beaten the hell on me with playing ping pong, which I'd never played before. But he he was interested because I was had a some kind of camera I was drawing all the time. And he he got uh he was on the verge of being a troublemaker. But he got interested in making photographs. And I gave him this old camera that I had and he took it, uh went to uh on a trip to Washington and he was sold. I mean most of the pictures were double exposed, but he really got into it. Mm -hmm. And then, then it, it went forward to, to a, another situation. I was on the way to work in a movie in New Mexico and I met this family and there's this little boy, he's maybe seven years old and he was working with us, uh, the uh, Mac uh, computers. And uh, we know the ones that were colored and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and he was going crazy with it. He was, he was doing really interesting stuff. And when he got to high school, he actually made this, um, a war movie. Yeah. War movie, and wow. you know it's it's so fascinating that and yeah with the with the cameras like the Sony came out with a this camera where you can, you can do productions with a full the full deal with this yeah. little you know phone and that that's so it's uh, it's pretty amazing I love it I love it. I think it's going to get even more interesting I think as it goes on I love that there's no shortage of talent there's no shortage of creativity there's just shortage I think of pipelines and access into this business. Um, you know, Doug, I actually, I want to pivot to you quickly. And it's something also that Carl mentioned earlier. You know, when we talk about pipelining for this industry, I think we focus a lot on above the line jobs, right? There's writer and directors programs all around town, but, you know, post-production jobs, production jobs, um, I think are often overlooked, but they're excellent careers. It's certainly something that was, you know, driving our strategy when we were talking about the curriculum for the Roybal film and television magnet that just opened, um, in LA, uh, I think last week, which is so exciting. Um, and so, you know, we're focusing on, on a lot of craft positions there. Um, I'd love to hear from you, you know, what kind of education is necessary for people to excel in these jobs? What steps should people be taking 
um, if they're interested in these types of roles? Yeah, I mean, I, I tell all of my classes that, you know, your career fantasy is always drilling that 90 yard uh, touchdown pass, you know, on the first play of the game and you just your your career is set, you know, and the truth is your your career is going to look a lot more like a really long game of pinball and you're going to be bouncing around. You're going to be doing things. And you're going to gather knowledge as you go. Um, and I, I think part of it is this focus on directing top line stuff. Uh, is maybe overemphasized. And I'll tell you, as, as somebody who's been in post for a long time, I'm, I'm an editor as well as a producer and director, and uh, there's so much opportunity. I get asked every two or three days, hey, you know any editors? Is there anybody available? And this is just the doc space, let alone the the, the fiction space and all the other places that it gets useful. Um, and I, I literally say the same thing as everybody's working. I'm sorry, all my people are working. Yeah. I don't know anybody who's available. This is the niche. This is the, the zone that can be filled by great rising talent. And now more than ever, people can rise faster because those positions are open to people who are really ready to, to move up and to, to, to just show their great skills. So I say, please focus on things like editing and sound. I love sound. I started in sound myself. And it's incredibly lucrative. It's, uh, it's, it's great learning if you want to go to other positions in the set. You learn everything because you can hear everybody talking. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, it's one of those great skills that if you have it, you can work anywhere in the world. Same thing with editing, same thing with uh, color timing and, and color correction. Um, these are the things that we're trying to promote more and more as viable career paths, whether you want to go to some other path later or if that is your career. I know some great editors who are the happiest people I know in the industry. Yeah. I love that. Look, I think, again, it goes similar theme that we've been talking about and we've been touching on throughout this conversation, right? It's like that idea to kind of explore and try things and see things. It's, this industry actually is about skill. It's about figuring out what you like, what your natural talents are, and, and kind of developing and leaning into that because there's a space in this industry for everyone. Um, Carl, I, I, kind of similar to the, to the pipeline question, um, you know, a lot of the times when we talk about uh, pipelining in this industry as well. We're talking about a lot of programs that might be focused on elementary schools, uh, might be focused on high schools, right? And inspiring young people is really amazing, but at the same time, we're not gonna be able to hire those kids for four, eight, 10, 12 years when they're out of school. So can you talk about efforts that you think the industry should be putting in place to um, invest in other programs, other communities, other populations to fast track change across the industry? Oh, that's a big one, Ruben. Uh, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know that we have enough time to really dive deeply into that, but I would say uh, one of my philosophies and strategies that I often use with clients is we backwards map. If you come to partner with one of the programs that um, I've been involved with helping to create and run, or if you're bringing me on board to help you build something uh, in-house, I say backwards map it. Know it. Know the jobs that they can fill. Know how many jobs that they that you have that will be available, and then look to train people to do those jobs. Um, and and don't feel compelled to have a large number. Um, I it, this is just my personal belief that often uh, people get uh, really sort of mystified by not mystified that's the wrong word they they want to have the big number and say that they've trained a hundred people but for me it's about placement how many can you reasonably place and one thing that i say in almost every meeting is one is better than zero and so mm -hmm. if you are able to train two people to do the two jobs that you have available you've already made a a small change and and that's impactful because then that provides a case for you to build around uh, the pilot program that you may want to start. And then you know the areas where you can scale. Um, th the other thing is really, when you're doing training, really be thoughtful about the training that you're providing. Uh, there's a corporate side to this business. There's a creative side to this business. If your uh, talent acquisition uh, processes and workflows are really set up for someone who's going through an academic institution and going to get interviewed by uh, your sort of process that would put them in a corporate environment. You really can't apply that same setup for someone going into a creative job. Um, you're going to miss out on talent because maybe their background won't allow for them to be 
able to be hired because they are a returning citizen, or maybe something about the way that they interview because they are former foster youth uh, won't allow for them to put their best foot forward. So you really have to be thoughtful about how you want to evaluate whether someone's really ready to work within your company. Um, so I, I, I'm jumping around because there's just so much to really focus on, but I would say be thoughtful about corporate tracks, creative tracks, and then business jobs within that uh, creative space and make sure that you're aligning those career pathways with people that really want to go down those paths. Um, there's no general training that you can do that would have someone prepared to work in this space. And so you have to be really specific about how you're preparing them and know exactly where they're going to land. I love that. Uh, so many incredible nuggets of wisdom. We're going to turn over to some audience questions. But Sumi, I actually wanted to go back to you really quickly um, because you're you're in it. You're it. GEI is in this right now. You guys are running some programs. So let's let's talk about some of the work that you're doing. Can you share some insight into your work and to your strategy? What have you found um, that is really, really working? Yeah, and um, honestly, Carl has probably answered most of that in his uh, responses. But yeah, so just to give you guys some background context, so GEI was started um, in August 2020. It was co-founded by Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively. So they do provide the much needed funding that we need on a day-to-day -day basis to survive. Um, but what it was really initially set up to do um, in August 2020 was right in the middle of COVID, right when production had slowed down. Um, but they really wanted to make sure um, that they could diversify their own productions and projects. And so when Ryan and Blake initially started it, they were like, we just want to be able to provide diverse entry-level opportunities um, for folks from underrepresented communities on our own productions and projects. And they kicked it off um, in 2021 with Netflix's and Ryan's uh, The Atom Project that was um, filmed in Vancouver. Uh, Netflix hired um, eight uh, GEI trainees. And the way that they had initially done it is Ryan had put out this massive um, application call. And, you know, when someone like Ryan puts out a social media call like that, you get 60,000 applications. Um, sure. Most of them are not the people that we are trying to serve. Um, so that was probably learning number one <laughs> is maybe don't put out a massive application call. So I actually joined the team about six or seven months after that. Um, and when I came on, kind of speaking to what Carl was saying, it's really, it's not just about the training and the access to the jobs, it's also about those wraparound services. And underrepresented communities, GEI works with all sorts of populations. We're working with people of color, women, folks with disabilities, former foster and homeless youth that are entering the workforce for the first time and just wanna know how to navigate an entertainment career. And then folks that have been previously incarcerated and are re-entering the workforce. Mm. So it's all different populations. They all require different types of wraparound service services. So the way we now recruit is we actually work with like-minded pipeline organizations, local community colleges in the area, um, and really develop and establish relationships with those organizations because they know who the participants are that need help, what kind of help they need, and then how GEI can help them accelerate their career track. So that's kind of how we do it, especially during COVID. You know, I think one thing that we learned about our GEI participants is that there was a lot of other things that they were going through during COVID. A lot of them are low income. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of their, you know, they support their families. They work two or three jobs um, and they're really trying to help their families out. And a lot of them lost their jobs because they worked in restaurants and hospitality on the side. So we kind of came in and helped support them. We connected them to resources in the area, provided stipends when needed just to keep them going. We gave and funded transportation to get even not just to and from their GEI related jobs, but also just their normal day jobs. So we kind of stepped in and kind of changed GEI a little bit during COVID to provide those extra services. Um, and so I think, you know, those are the big learnings is, you know, don't do an open, open application process when you have a big name like Ryan Reynolds. Work with those organizations that are already doing the great work and help accelerate um, the help that their participants need. And then secondly, you know, make sure just exactly what Carl said, he um, hit it on the head, is just make sure that you're giving those wraparound services. These people, you know, they don't have the access or the network, you know, they, they really need to understand how to kind of navigate it within their own personal lives as well. It's, it's such a, a really, really important point that there's, there's a lot that we can do that can be performative. There's a lot that we can do to be really meaningful. So industry informed education and curriculum in our classrooms, wrap, you know, programs with wraparound services, really, really critical to, to moving the needle. Um, we're gonna take some questions from the folks that have tuned in here. 
Uh, the first question, really important, which I think, Sumi, thank you so much for teeing this up because inclusion and diversity across this industry takes a lot of different forms and shapes. And we have a, a question that's come in uh, for us to discuss here quickly. What advice can we offer for older people who are looking uh, to Hollywood and are looking for creative spaces for a career change? Um, Doug, let's start with you and then we'll, we'll come over to Susan. Yeah, I mean, what's what's great about being older or more seasoned, as I'd like to think of it, um, the, uh, the the truth is you've just lived more life. So you you have that to offer. You have more more experience in just handling day to day issues and, and how to navigate the world. So I think it's a it's a big bonus, actually, to have somebody coming in who might be older, who's who's got that life experience. And in fact, some of my students who want to race out into the industry, I think it, go have some life experiences first. Go go get a little older and, and you'll gradually get uh, more things to talk about. So in at all levels of the industry, you have more stories to tell and you have more, uh, more things you can relate to as you're working in the business. Um, in terms of getting into it, um, I, you know, I think because you're older, you tend to have better skills with just hitting the streets and knowing knowing how to research things and go find things. Um, offset maybe a little bit by not being as familiar with the very latest, you know, social app or whatever. Um, I think if we gave the balance training of how to how to use all the resources that are out there to uh, to find where the where the work is, where the where the access is, um, that would really help on the older front. Like let's let's have you know social media awareness training more uh, mm -hmm. for people who need it, um, who might be coming into it, who who aren't as familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's just one idea. That's a great point. Susan, thoughts on this? I mean, it depends on the older person that you're talking about. What is their skill set? You know, what do they bring to the table as a human being and as somebody who might work in the industry? It's it's hard to sort of give a blanket um, sort of piece of advice, but I completely agree with what Doug said. If it's about storytelling, if it's about writing, um, the more you live, the more stories you have to tell. So, um, and there's no sort of age that anybody ever puts on a screenplay. So if you're a writer, for sure, if you're in another area, if you're, if you're a lawyer, or if you're somebody who likes to, to cook, there, there are going to be, there's going to be a different path and there, there's going to be different advice. It's so sort of broad, but I'd say in general, value yourself, that, you know, have a good sense of what your own skills are, what you might bring, try to learn about the jobs. I, I love the conversation here today about the jobs behind the jobs, um, you know, the, the most visible jobs, um, writing, directing, acting are not the only jobs in Hollywood at all. And there are other immensely creative and rewarding positions that people just have to know about to want to go for. And so, you know, if you're a student, and I deal a lot with students, try everything. As Eli was saying, it's important to, to fail at some things, to discover new things that you're interested in, um, so that you can kind of figure out what your path should be. And you might find an aspect of yourself you never expected or discovered, or, or expected to discover. I love it. Super important. This next question, I think, is actually one that comes up all of the time. So we're going to make some space for it. Um, Carl, we're going to start with you. And then Sumi would love your point of view on this as well. How can students that don't live in L.A. find opportunities mm -hmm. in the entertainment industry? Um, are a majority of their jobs in L.A. or New York if they're studying in the middle of the country? What can they be doing to tap in to careers uh, in our business? Carl? You know, funnily enough, I was kind of in this position um i was looking to uh make a transition i had been laid off of my second job out of college and i wanted to work in hollywood this was many many moons ago and i was in north carolina which is where i'm from greensboro and i was trying to find ways to get into the industry i started with applying for just jobs and on the i think it's entertainment job, entertainmentcareers.net or something. And none of that worked. And now that I'm working from within the industry, I understand why. First, I really needed to study the industry. I really needed to study what it means to uh, work in TV, work in film, 
I was old enough to find the resources that would be available to someone who's outside the bubble and just figure out, okay, so here's what I'd like to do. Here's what I'm good at. What jobs are aligned with those, those, those things that I like to do? And then study how to get those jobs. Is it a unionized job? Do I need to become a union member? How do you do that? Once you start to look at the, the, the universe that's in, that is Hollywood that way, then you gain some clarity. The other part is really, really, really hard, but it's, it, this is a relationship town. You know, people hire and work with people they know and, and people they like. Uh, and so I started to try to meet as many people as possible. My, one of my mentors to this day, I, I won't say his name because I didn't tell him I was gonna talk about it, but <laughs> he, he's an executive at Lionsgate. And I just randomly reached out to him and said, hey, I just want to pick your brain. Would you talk to me? And he, he was surprised me and said, yes. Yeah. And he gave me some insights. And I was, I, to this day, ask him over and over, why did he do that? And he said, because you never know who, where this person might end up and who they might be. And so I would say, try to build as many relationships as possible by going to events, by uh, just meeting people in the industry. And while the headquarters are in LA, and in the, the big uh, metropolitan cities, the production is not, you know, the, there's production happening all over Atlanta, in Alabama, in North Carolina, you know, figure out where that, that uh, work is and, and those companies that are local to that area that do the work and see if you can build relationships there. Uh, that actually pays dividends when a company knows that you live in an area and you understand it and you're trying to do some work in that area. Um, and then the last thing I would say, and this is counterintuitive, but and it's not really taught, but it's lean into who you are. And that means all the quirks, all the idiosyncrasies, even all of the, the, the drama that may come with the, the environment and the life that you live in. People in this creative world wanna hear that. So you lean into it when you're talking to them. Um, and, and that just makes you a, a, a wealth of, of knowledge. It, uh, gives you a chance to talk about your experience and and that experience is applicable in some of these creative jobs. So that would be my advice. Authenticity is super important. I mean, Sumi, again, you know, over to you. I think one of the benefits of the pandemic was that everybody was taking their meetings on Zoom, making this industry a little bit more accessible. Um, have you found that to be working as a solution for students who are not here in LA? Yeah, um, I would say the virtual aspect of it has been great for, you know, GEI. And just one thing is we don't just work in LA and New York. Um, so the beauty, I know I've been talking a lot with an LA face because that's my background, but the the beauty is that right now, exactly what to Carl, Carl said is productions are happening everywhere and we're partnering with most of those productions in all the major studios. So right now, um, for those folks that are like, why are you guys only in LA and New York? We are in LA, New York City, Atlanta, Long Island, Jersey City, Cleveland, Boston, Dallas, Chicago, Albuquerque, Vancouver, and Toronto. So we're working with all sorts of people in all sorts of cities because productions are happening in those cities and they don't just happen once, especially a lot of states, you know, New Mexico, Ohio, they're all starting to expand upon their film tax credit. And within those film tax credits, you're going to get incentives to hire diverse people on sets that are local. And so what we're seeing with GEI is we're working with all sorts of cities, um, people obviously in those cities. We want to make sure they get hired local. Um, so if you are, if you're interested in GEI, check out our website, groupefortinitiative.com, and ask to be a part of it no matter where you are, because we are you know, working in a lot of cities across North America. And then we're starting to open up our doors to um, communities in Sydney, the UK, and Rome as well. So you know, I think my biggest thing for you guys is apply for us, apply with our program, and hopefully we can give you those opportunities. And just like what Ruben just said, um, we are also offering a lot of our training virtually right now. And we're going to continue doing that. We're going to have in-person stuff in, you know, the major cities because that's where our biggest roster is. But we are doing virtual events every month so that people that are not in those cities can really take an opportunity of what we have to offer. Well, there you go. You just got 60,000 more applications. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Um, we'll move on here. One of our last questions. Um, and this, this is, we'll open it up to the group. Uh, Doug, we'll start with you and then we'll come back over to Susan and Eli. Um, what are some of the best ways to seek out community and support or our support system in industries that are so competitive and often 
cut throat. Let's try to unpack that, Doug. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, the, the thing I like to tell everybody is try not to think of it as, you know, uh, American gladiators. You're not, you're not out to knock everybody off and climb over the dead bodies of your enemies. That's, that's not, the, that's not the, the, the way that the industry should work. And that's fortunately in documentary where, you know, this community is very supportive um, and, and we trade a lot of resources. We, we share um, not just, you know, knowledge, but we also share social events and we, we get together. We, we talk about, you know, where we want to go. We, we invite uh, the, the young community to come in. Uh, we've, we've had events where we actually try to find new talent and we try to encourage that. Um, there's, there's one great uh, a resource for, for our specific thing called the, the Alliance of Documentary Editors. And if you Google that, it's out there. They actually have, they, they have been so forward thinking about the future of where the industry should go that they actually have a hiring board that's specifically BIPOC uh, editors. And, and if, you're, if you go there, you can see this entire list, a very long list of people who are available right now to to be a part of your your documentary crew and and come in and be an editor and assistant editor uh they have other focuses um uh that are on their hiring boards as well and that's what i'd like to see more in the industry is focus on that where the resources that are so needed they're easy to get to people know of, they can share them um and we're trying to really encourage that i send that to everybody uh, when they ask me for those editors i say have you have you looked at the the uh ades um uh, BIPOC list. It's fantastic. Yeah. Excellent resource. Susan, thoughts? Well, I think that you want to, depending on what area you're interested in, you want to reach out to unions um, to see what um, programs are being offered. Some of them are virtual. The WGA, the DGA, um, the Editors Union have seminars. Um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences has programs that are both virtual and in person and are available to everybody. Um, I think that um, you also, if you're, if you're coming from elsewhere to Hollywood, and most of us have come from elsewhere to Hollywood, I'm from Arizona, you know, <laughs> I didn't know anybody in the business when I, when I got here. Um, you want to think about the movies you've loved and write an old fashioned letter, you know, whether it comes in the form of an email or whether it's on paper, which is often takes people by surprise. They don't know what paper is anymore and you can't kind of get rid of it as easily as an email. So it haunts you until you deal with it. So I say write a, a letter to the person whose work has changed your life or influenced you in some way. It has enormous impact. It's changed my career path a couple of times. Um, because I took the time out to just write something that was from the heart and that was very meaningful to me to to another person. And they became, if not a mentor to me, um, somebody who reached out and helped me in some small way with a piece of advice or an introduction to somebody else. So um, don't underestimate the power of your passion for a particular movie that meant something to you or a piece of television or a documentary, don't underestimate um, that your feelings about that can have an impact on what your path will be. Another really, really excellent piece of advice. Eli, um, any, we'll, we'll turn it over to you for some final thoughts. Any advice on folks who are looking to build community and a support system in this industry? Well, first thing you have to do is meet these other people and get in groups and start Working out, uh, working out ideas. It's like uh, imagine rock and rollers that were, where kids started out and all of a sudden they're doing all kinds of things. I think the same thing can happen now. I mean, the communication skills that you can get to are pretty amazing. It's a really absolutely extraordinary. And I think a lot of interesting people are going to come out of that uh, reality yeah. in the future. Right. And Liz, I, I think just in one final thought here is just doubling down on something that Carl said, similar to what you're saying, don't underestimate, you know, the value of your passion and your interests. When Carl said he reached out randomly to someone and they're now still his mentor, you just never know. Take the shots that you can take and you never know where they're going to lead. You don't need an immediate result, right? It could take time to, to cultivate these relationships. I could go on and on and on. We have a ton of questions that we didn't even get to. We knew that, that this was going to happen. Thank you all so much for being here to Doug and Carl and Susan and Sumi and Eli. 
for this incredible conversation. Thank you all for tuning in today. And of course, to our friends at STARS for always making space for us to have these important conversations. We appreciate the work and for having us here today. To find out more about STARS Take the Lead, visit starstakethelead.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time.